Welcome back, everyone. It's hard to believe that we're wrapping up this three-part, this trifecta of authentic conversations between STEM ecosystems leaders from across the globe and the STEM Next Fellows. And today we have a special opportunity to learn from and think together with STEM Next Fellows and SLACOP leads about what's working in STEM, both in school and outside of school time, maybe just as, as importantly, how do we know that it is working? This is a question that many of the STEM ecosystem leads have put forth, and today we'll get closer to the answers for this critical question. Presented by the STEM Learning Ecosystems Community of Practice and STEM Next Opportunity Fellows, special thanks to the STEM Next Opportunity Fund and TIES for making today's webinar possible. The STEM ecosystems, for those of you new to this initiative, are supported by TIES, uh, and you can find them at stemecosystems.org. The ecosystems harness the power of business and industry, funders and foundations, K-12 schools, higher education, out of school time, and more to find solutions to common problems and to build thriving communities. Kind of related, the STEM Next Opportunity Fellowship provides opportunities for STEM education experts to contribute their knowledge, skills, and expertise to support federal agencies to expand access to STEM education. STEM Next Opportunity Fellows experience firsthand working in a federal agency to ensure that more students access great STEM learning in and out of schools. Mm -hmm. And fellowships range from one to four years, depending on agency needs and funding. And this isn't uh, something that's written down here, but I've got to tell you, it's such a cool experience from everyone who I've talked to about about it. And if it's something that you're interested in, I highly recommend you reach out to XAN and, and learn more. Embracing the ecosystem way, today's webinar will provide a space and time for leaders to share common challenges, ideas, and resources. Conversations will revolve around successful models and new ideas to support STEM learning experiences during and beyond this time of social distancing. These are interactive conversations where you'll have the opportunity to ask questions to our experts. And since we're in a Zoom meeting mode today, not webinar mode, you're free to ask any question you'd like. Just uh, do us a favor and uh, first choice, you should see down at the bottom a little reactions button. If you click on that, you can click on it now. In there, there's another button that says raise hand. If you've got a question, click that raise hand button and we'll come to you to ask your question. If you don't feel totally comfortable asking the question, your other option is to click that chat button down at the bottom, put your question there, and I or someone else from the uh, TIES and SLECOP teams will ask that question for you. My name is Jeremy Shore, and thank you for joining us today for a conversation as we explore the work of the STEM Next Opportunity Fellows and think about ways that we as ecosystem leads might make the work of our ecosystems even more impactful in the lives of the students in our communities. I'm really excited today. I'm excited because I've met a lot of people. I joined the Ecosystem Initiative about seven years ago, and I've met a whole lot of people in that amount of time. And two of the those people that I've frankly learned the most from our our, uh, our 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 speakers today, Patty Curtis and Melissa Moritz. I'm I'm always excited to see them up on the docket. Uh, Melissa Moritz is the inaugural after school and summer learning fellow serving the U.S. Department of Education's Institute of Educational Services. Previously, Moritz served as the Vice President of Strategic Initiatives for the National Math and Science Initiative, NIMSI. Uh, prior to joining NIMSI, she served on the Obama, uh, the Obama Biden administration as the Deputy Director of STEM at the U.S. Department of Education and supported STEM policy and programs that focused on STEM teaching and learning from preschool to workforce. She began her career as a middle school science uh, student at MS321, a children's aid society school in New York City. Melissa, I, I think this is such a cool opportunity, this, this STEM Next Fellows thing. And I'm, I'm hoping that as part of your introduction, you could just tell us one or two little nuggets that you've gained or learned throughout this process. Um, I think your perspective is particularly cool because you already served at the federal level, um, So, but you're in a different role now. So what's that difference like and what have you been able to do? Great question. And hey, everybody, it's so great to see you. And um, as Jeremy's introducing Patty and myself, please share, you know, who you are and where you're joining from. Um, I'm recognizing some familiar faces and names, but really excited to get to know all of you on the line if we haven't connected before. Um, so you asked me what's different and what have I learned? Um, so yes, this is a little bit of a, it has been, this last year has been a little bit of a homecoming. It's been really great to be back at the department. There's a lot of familiar faces, um, some offices and titles, you know, changed in the four years since I served, but it's been really great to be back with a lot of folks who are so committed to educational equity in lots of different ways, shapes, and forms. 
Um, this time I am serving specifically in the Institute of Education Sciences, and you'll hear more about this as we talk today, but IES is actually the independent research arm of the U.S. Department of Ed. And so we're really, you know, as most of Ed is, really obsessed with evidence-based practice, and IES really um, funds a lot of research and evaluation efforts in, in education. So that has been a, a key difference for me is um, sort of the position where I'm sitting is has a slightly different lens. Um, and then this time my role is broader than STEM, but inclusive of STEM. So it's been fun to jump back into some of the STEM work um, that I had been doing previously, but also really thinking about some of the, the key pieces of, out, of the out of school time system and what needs to be different at this moment in time. And lastly, it's a really different policy environment. So when I was there in 2015, 2017, you know, we had the white, the uh, Dem, you know, Obama obviously was in the White House, um, Republicans controlled Congress. Um, there was no new money flowing, none, zip, zilch. So the question was always, what can you really do without new money, without new programs? Um, and so we did a lot of communications efforts, a lot of signaling, a lot of convening, um, that is a very different policy environment to what we're in right now, where we have historic resources being funneled into the elementary and secondary education system. And therefore, the kind of maneuvers are different and the different ways we think about policy are different. And there are many, many, many more needs and many, many more complexities than there were in 2017. Um, so, you know, which we can certainly get into more and more, but those are some of the pieces. Thank you for pulling that curtain a tiny bit. Uh, Melissa, I, I always love her, hearing those things. And uh, we also have with you today, Patty Curtis. Patty's the new Robert Noyce Ellen Leffin Informal STEM Education Fellow serving the Office of Planning, Evaluation, and Policy Development at the U.S. Department of Education. Previously, Curtis served as the Director of the Washington, D.C. Office of the Museum of Science and the National Center for Technology Literacy, where she focused on advancing formal and out-of-school PK-12 engineering education across the nation by advocating for federal and state policies and programs. And I'll tell you right now that, that Patty's uh, biography then goes on for like 14 more paragraphs um, that you really should read because it's insanely impressive. Uh, Patty, I'm hoping that you could kind of answer similarly. So, so I, I suspect that for most of your career, you've interacted with the Department of Ed. Um, but I, I'm curious what those of us who interact with the Department of Ed maybe don't know about what the process is like when you're actually inside. Oh, Jeremy, thanks for drawing attention to my long bio. It only comes with age, you see. So <laughs> the longer you're around, the more you get to do, I guess. So, um, but thank you for having me. Appreciate the invitation. It's a pleasure working with my colleague, Melissa, who I worked with when she was at the department. I previously served as a STEM lobbyist. A lot of people don't like that word, but you know, that's what we do. We advocate, we collect. We like it when it's for STEM, Patty. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of good, you know, good lobbyists out there working on educational policies and, and other things, you know, to help people. So um, it's, it's uh, definitely enlightening. I guess my answer was really short. I was thinking uh, my observation is that there's a lot of rules and regulations and acronyms. And it takes about a year or so just to get, you know, through that and then meet all the people. And we've had new people coming on, new political appointees um, that we welcome because, you know, we need the leadership to execute and, and implement on programs. So <clears throat> it's been a pleasure. I have moved from OPEPD, the Office of Planning, Policy Planning, Evaluation and whatever, development to the Office of Elementary and Secondary Education. And I'm working specifically with the 21st Century Community Learning Center team uh, and their after school programs and managing a small demonstration grant called Out of School Time Career Pathways, of which four states uh, receive funding to provide work-based learning experiences to youth if in the out-of-school space, and hopefully um, they will obtain some sort of industry-recognized credential, whether it's an internship, an apprenticeship, or some other, um, you know, badge or whatever that would help them kind of give them a leg up in the work for, in the STEM workforce. So that's been, that's been uh, really exciting. And I will say, um, it's like night and day, you know, between the first two years and the second two years of my administration. Um, I feel like 
there's a lot more um, openness and willingness to like talk about STEM and to advance STEM. We have leadership support. Uh, so we are moving in that direction and it's really exciting. So I think part of the moral of the story there is um, give folks who are working the Department of Ed a little bit of grace while they navigate and figure out those, uh, those thousands of acronyms and all of the policies and procedures and politics and all of those things. But it's always, I, I think, so exciting to know that we've got friends of the ecosystems that are in these positions and are advocating for the young, uh, young people in our, our regions the same way that we are. Those connections are, are really, truly so critical for all of us. All right, so Melissa, tell us a, a little bit more about this incredible STEM Next Opportunity Fellowship and help our SLE COP leads think about the ways to increase the impact of STEM mm -hmm. education experiences around the globe. Sure, um, happy to do that. Um, and, you know, as you just said, there, the connection here is really important to us. Um, so just to underscore what Patty shared about um, this administration and the team at Ed being really open to both advocating for STEM, but also to stakeholder engagement. The work that you're doing on the ground, you know, if you are using, which we'll talk about in a little bit, American Rescue Plan funds, et cetera, if you're using ARP funds to support your programs, if you're using, um, you know, 21st century to advance informal STEM opportunities for young people. Those examples are so, so, so helpful to us. Um, and we encourage you to send them. Patty just popped her email in the chat. I'll pop mine into the chat at the same time. Um, send them our way. We constantly are compiling best practices, emerging practices, great uses of American Rescue Plan funds in particular. And that's like just critical, as well as, you know, the ongoing challenges, right, which I'm hoping that we get to talking a little bit about today with you all, like some of the ongoing challenges in terms of ARP fund, either ARP or, you know, traditional ed formula or discretionary grant programs, which we can map out for you as well. Um, I'm now totally forgetting, you said the fellows program. Yes. <laughs> so here, here we go. Yeah, so the fellows program is, um, and if someone has a question, I think I just heard some, feel free to, feel free to jump in if you had a question. Um, but I think the big thing to know is that the fellows program provides an opportunity for subject matter experts to join the administration. We currently have five fellows. Two of us are at ed, two are at the Office of Science and Technology Policy, um, Quincy and Karen, who I think you met Quincy before, and Karen is our newest fellow to join the team. And then Stephanie, who I know some folks um, met with last month is from the Department of Labor. So we currently have five of us. We will probably have closer to 10 by the end of this year. Um, in general, fellows serve for between two and four years. Um, there's sort of a max of four years based on the Code of Federal Regulations. And we do have opportunities, you know, all across the agencies. There's just um, depends on funds, interest of the agencies, et cetera. There are actually three open fellow positions right now on the STEM Fellows website, STEM Next, um, which I'll pop the website in. If any of you are interested, you know, feel free to pass it along to folks who you think would be great to serve in federal roles. Most of the roles um, do require at least regular um, presence in the DC area, um, and more and more so as people are sort of returning post COVID. Uh, so, you know, I would flag that as well, but feel free to share those links. And um, yeah, it's a great opportunity. It was, it's been a great way to come back, um, especially, you know, there's lots of different inroads into federal service and um, it's been a, a great opportunity. All right, so I, I think what's up next uh, on the agenda is that two of you are going to talk a, a bit about the ED funds and programs that, that are available for, for everyone. I know I'm excited. I People know that that I do some work here at the, at the ecosystem level in Cleveland, um, and so I'm selfishly looking forward to, to learning more about some of these opportunities. Yeah, we thought it could make sense. And Exan, if you're able to share your screen, that would be or share the slides. That'd be awesome. Apologies that my um, mine wasn't working fully well. We thought what might make the most sense is just starting with kind of a high level overview, since we didn't have the opportunity to really go in depth at the meet and greet that we did now three, four months ago. Um, so we thought it might make sense to just give you a little bit of a sense of kind of how the money flows at Ed and what opportunities might be available for you or ecosystems or partners and organizations you work with. 
Um, and so we wanted to just run through that quickly, um, as well as then talk with you and open up a dialogue about what engagement looks has looked like with your state education agency or local education agency to really understand sort of the opportunities and challenges around partnership. So we'll go ahead and dive right in. I'll kick us off with talking about some of the relief funds and then turn it over to Patty, um, who will take it away to talk about some of the formula and discretionary funds that are available for ed. Um, and then we'll, we'll close out by talking about some of the evidence-based practices. Um, we do mean STEM and CS education and research. Thank you, Patty. Um, on the next slide, Exan, um, wanted to sort of talk about, um, there are, um, I don't know if it's advancing for you, but anyway, we wanted to, we wanted to open up by sort of sharing that there are lots of different ways that dollars go from, um, the go from the Federal Department of Education or from taxpayers, Congress then both authorizes and appropriates. Appropriates is the key term. That means money gets put against the authorized activities. So oftentimes you'll have these bills that go through and there's great you know, enthusiasm and there's like then there are authorized activities, which means people can do the things. But if there's no money put against them, that can make it really hard to actually carry out. And Patty knows that from, from her life as an advocate. Um, and so there are a few different ways that money flows to the Department of Ed for STEM and computer science. We have these emergency funds, which we'll talk a little bit about formula programs, discretionary grant programs, and then we did pop in some resources and we'll make sure that this, um, the PowerPoint is available for you all. On the next slide, I wanted to just talk through some of the emergency funds that are available. Um, so you all are obviously probably very well familiar with the CARES Act um, and then the ESSER and GEAR and SURSA funds as well. And then the American Rescue Plan that was just authorized, which is the ESSER 3 funds that are flowing out. In the, that's the, the big number of 120, 122 billion. And I will say that this administration right now is very focused on the implementation of those American Rescue Plan funds. So again, if you have examples of the ways that ARP funds are playing out on the ground, um, if that is enabling you or your partners within the ecosystem to be able to increase the services that you're providing to young people, um, increase the evaluation or research activities that you're doing, um, in, increase the supports that you're providing. We love, love, love those examples and we love to lift them up in talking points, site visits and other opportunities. And if we don't know about them, we can't lift them up. So please do share them with us directly. Um, just to give you a sense on the next slide um, of the some of the American Rescue Plan particulars. Um, so there are, and I think, um, there, I wanted to make sure to emphasize this particular bullet. So there are some state set-asides. There's a 1% set-aside at the state level focused on after school. There's a 1% set-aside at the state level focused on summer. There's a 5% um, set-aside at the state level that's focused on the impact of lost instructional time. And then really right now, we are focused a lot on this 20% of LEA allocations used to address the impact of lost instructional time. We wanted to highlight this specifically for you all, since so many of you are doing work at the local level, that this is really a huge opportunity for STEM and computer science. Um, you could imagine lots and lots of ways that STEM and computer science can be used to address the impact of lost instructional time, to teach in different ways, to accelerate learning in new opportunities, and so wanted to make sure to highlight that. Um, if you don't know what your state is, is planning for the ARP pl funds, they're all of the state plans are on the ed website and I'll pop the direct link into the chat. I really, really encourage you to read that and see if STEM or computer science pops up. If it doesn't pop up, don't despair. Um, it's just good information. There are still a ton of flexibility right now with how the funds are being spent. They are not all obligated. And so it gives you good insight into how your state is thinking about what the biggest priorities needs to be. But it doesn't mean that that's the only thing that's going to be that funds will be spent on and might give you some clues. I always try to think about it as like a little treasure map, like get look for the clues that help you to figure out who you might need to reach out to or what the biggest priorities are or how you might talk about your work in the in the same language that the state education agencies are using. Because again, I know you all are set up to be incredible partners, either to the state education agency or local education agencies or both. And so seeing how they write about what their plans are can be really incredible clues to help both with your communications efforts and how you're thinking about programming. So that is that. Um, 
I will definitely pop the website in. And then I'm going to turn it over to Patty, who's going to talk about, uh, again, if you think about Ed as kind of like a big bank where money comes in and money goes out, there's different ways that money comes out. So the emergency funds um, are ones that I just talked about. And then there's formula funds and discretionary funds that also flow a little bit differently than the emergency funds. So Patty, over to you. Thanks, Melissa. And just for those, if you didn't catch it, the SEA is the State Education Agency or your State Department of Education. And the LEAs are the local education agencies or your school districts. So just, you know, and then I, like even Jeremy called us the ED, we say ED because the DOE and DC, which is the District of Columbia, is the Department of Energy. So just to get a few acronyms uh, cleared up, um, and if we'll go to the next slide, I can start talking about some of the, what we call formula grants. So these are congressionally mandated programs um, that, again, the authorizers say, you know, these are the things we'd like to accomplish. And then the appropriators, a completely different body, uh, you know, and personalities of members of Congress that write the checks, right? They, they have to do the budgeting and they decide which agency gets how much. So um, the formula grants, you know, have often had much higher authorization levels than they've had appropriations, but we can only deal with what's been appropriated. So it's been deposited sort of in our bank, and then we have a formula that we then distribute it to the states, often based on student population, um, low-income student population. Most of our programs are designed to address that stu those students. Um, so formula for, I'm um, sorry, Title IV Part A is a combination of multiple grants that were, um, you know, individual and resided in different areas and managed by different people at the state departments. So when this all came together, it was like a scramble for the states to figure out who was going to be in charge of these funds. And it varies from district to district and state or state to state. One of the programs that was sort of wrapped into this is the old math science partnership program, which was a professional development program for teachers. It was part of title two, it was a set aside, there was money assigned to math and science and you know, STEM in those days was not as frequently used until the new legislation. Um, but these funds flow to the states, then the states, you know, run it through to the local districts. They have to have a sort of a needs-based assessment and they have three buckets of funding. One is safe and healthy schools and students. Um, the second is a well-rounded education, which is where the STEM and computer science and arts and social studies and, you know, a lot of other sort of non-core top uh, subject areas reside. And then the third is um, the effective use of technology, which uh, took place of some of the prior programs that really provided funding for what I call gadgets and gears um, for actual hardware in the classroom, whether it was smart boards or other technologies. Um, but there were a lot of studies that said, you know, teachers don't know how to use these things. So now this is an emphasis on teacher professional development to use these technologies effectively in their classrooms. So they're not just sitting there because, you know, the budget was expiring and they have to use it or lose it. So we want to make sure they're making good use of the technology. And going back to the well-rounded, um, this is where the STEM um, component lies. And this is a, a billion point two uh, dollar program. So there's real money and each district has to get at least, I think, $10,000. And then these um, sort of buckets start to apply. So I think job one is to figure out who at the Department of State, I'm sorry for all this ambulance in my neighborhood here. Um, good. We still hear you clearly, Patty. Okay, great. Um, so figure out who the state department, who the state coordinator is in your um, department of education that manages this fund. Um, there will probably be a person that manages this fund, the next fund, all the other titles within the department. There is going to be a point person at the department that receives the money and disperses the money. So that's somebody that you need to know, right? Whether they do it by formula or if it's a competitive process. Um, and, you know, just that's, 
um, some of them were the Mass Science Partnership uh, coordinators. Some of them were the safe and healthy people. So they don't necessarily have any, any experience in STEM. So they're all, they, they may be all focused on like safe and healthy, you know, school counselors, obesity programs, like all good things, but they may not be STEM experts. So don't, don't expect them that, to be that. And you want, you want to go in and say, I'm here to help. I can help you spend those dollars. And this is how. Um, similarly, with the ARP funds, I was just on a call earlier with the deputy governor from Illinois, and he just said the districts are just overwhelmed. They're not even applying for the money. They don't have the capacity to write the grant to get the money, you know, which they're entitled to. They just have to put it on paper. Like, what's the plan? So another opportunity for ecosystems writ large is to, you know, go up and say, you know, to the school district, to your superintendent, to your principals, we can help you manage this money. We can write the grant. We can be your partner. You know, they have to be sort of the fiduciary recipient, but you guys can really help pitch in and write those plans and, you know, and they can purchase or engage with your programs and services. So that's my pitch for um, getting engaged at the local level. So Title IV Part B is where I'm working now in the 21st Century Community Learning Center programs. This is another billion point three dollar program that is, again, formula funding to the state. So it's based on a student population. And then it is competitively awarded within the state because there is just not enough money to provide all the after school programming that's necessary, right? The demand is much higher than the funds, even though it sounds like a lot of money, you know, it's it, like say the minimum was $10,000 per district. You can't really provide a full year school program, after school program for, you know, 500 kids with that kind of money. So it, there's not enough. So it's competitive to the districts. And oftentimes these are nonprofits, probably a lot of your membership, Boys and Girls Clubs, the YMCA, United Way. Um, and sometimes it's the school, you know, if they have a grant writer, if they have someone that can manage the money to provide those after school services. Um, and Patty, then um, just really quick before you move on. So Christina Gwen is asking in the chat, and I think it's a good question. And Melissa answered her a little bit, but, but I'd love to throw it to the two of you for folks not reading. She's saying, yeah, you know, I agree with you, but a lot of times the districts are so overwhelmed, they don't even have the bandwidth to say, yes, go do, go do this uh, because they have their own oversights and everything. Is there any conversation at ED, which I'll start saying instead of ED, um, <laughs> at ED to look at how dollars might flow directly to STEM nonprofits? And so the, just to, Patty, where I started was, so per congressional, per the law, the formula funds that ED gives out has to flow to the state and then the state passes them through the, to the district. Right. The state the, is our customer. The state is our customer. And so people can partner. And so you'll see in a lot of our messaging and a lot of our communications efforts that we are constantly holding up examples of partnership. Like, for example, we had an ARP summit a few weeks ago, um, the American Rescue Plan Summit, and there was a session focused on out of school time. Every single example, we brought the state education agency or the local education agency and one of their nonprofit partners to the table to showcase that ARP funds can be used on to partner and to, to, to be given out to nonprofits. But as Patty said, stays our customer. But we do have some discretionary grant programs that do enable um, nonprofit organizations to apply directly as long as they are applying in partnership with LEAs or a consortia of LEAs. Um, right. Yeah, Patty, what else would you add to that? Yeah, no, just, um, you know, it, like I said, a lot of nonprofits are eligible, but they have to be in partner with the school district, whether you're providing professional development to the teacher or you're providing direct services to the student. You know, obviously you want the school district in the mix. Sometimes there's requirements on, you know, their GPA or their attendance. So you're going to have to get records with from the school district. So there's a lot of partnership that needs to be built around that. But if you walk in and say, you know, we have a plan, we can write the grant, we can administer the dollars for you and service your teachers and your students and make it, you know, as easy as possible. 
you know, I, I saw one comment that they're laying people off and focusing on social emotional. I mean, you see that at the national level too. I mean, COVID was hell and it's still difficult, you know, for teachers and students to get back in the swing. There's still a lot of fear, you know, masking, no masking, you know, it's, I mean, even at our own federal department headquarters, there's, you know, reports daily of COVID, you know, COVID positive tests. So people are still afraid. And, you know, so the social emotional sort of priority is real. Um, but, you know, all these programs still exist. There's still opportunity for STEM prioritization and funding, it, but somebody has got to go in with that flag, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. otherwise somebody else is, is, you know, making more noise, getting more attention and more funding. And so, Selena, to, to your question about could the grants be used for professional development, so Title IV Part A, yes, definitely, and the whole focus of Title II Part A that's up on the board, uh, or that's up on the slide, excuse me, um, is focused on teacher professional development. So many of the formula dollars can be used to support teacher professional development, not solely Title II, which is all focused on professional development, um, but also within some of the other titles. Like if you're doing professional development for STEM, you can fund that using Title IV Part A. If you were you know, doing t uh, professional development to support English language learners, you could use some of your Title III dollars, for example. Or if you're doing uh, for teacher professional development to support students with disabilities, you could use some of your IDEA yes. money. So there's right. lots of different ways that you could combine funds from the Federal Department of Ed to support uh, teacher professional development, depending on which student groups you might be reaching and what the focus of the PD is. I've got a, a, a quick so kind of, oh, sorry, go ahead, Celine. I, I've got a, a quick sort of pro tip too. Um, if you're reaching out to districts and they're not responding because they're busy and all those things, as a as a 16 year school district administrator, I'll tell you, a lot of people approached me and I did ignore a lot of them because I didn't have the time. You know when I didn't? When I didn't was when the person that was reaching out to me had a relationship with the state level government and they came to me through the state level government probably directly to the superintendent. And this is part of why we, we keep encouraging those of you in ecosystems to make sure that you're building those relationships with your state representatives, your state board of education, um, the governor of your state, all of those things. Because if those folks come with you directly to a superintendent, that district is going to listen and there's a really high likelihood that they'll participate. And keep asking too. I mean, we find that a very effective way to engage like not all of it, you know, I'll be totally blunt, not, all, not every single ed leader that comes into the building has had experience with STEM either, just like you would find in any state education agency or local education agency. One really effective strategy that we use internally is site visits. So we always find that when people go and see STEM hands-on, minds-on learning, they're like, oh, this is great. Let's do, kids want, should get more of this. So keep inviting your, you know, the key stakeholders in your community out to see programs, um, out to, you know, come join you and do X, Y, and Z. It's a really great strategy. And then also feel free to invite the federal leaders too. You know, we're always happy, you know, send those invites up to the to the U.S. Department of Ed. We're always happy to, to field them, um, whether that's conferences or whether that's, you know, site visits to come and visit programs. We, Obviously, with everybody, no one can say yes to everything, but, um, you know, it's a great way to engage people. Well, that was a nice little so, sidebar, I think, with a lot of good takeaways. Uh, Patty, back to you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, just to build on that uh, sort of grassroots interaction, you know, sort of the back to school tour is is always very popular for the political appointees and they're always looking for, you know, good uh, sort of investments, Department of Ed investments that they can highlight in their visits. So let's, I think we talked about, you know, all the, the titles um, that are the formula grants, again, driven by Congress um, and funding from the appropriators. So if you can go to the next slide. I think we're going to talk about some of the discretionary grants. Are and any of these grants this? for technology upgrades for, uh, for Ed? <laughs> uh, so while, while Xan is getting that slide loaded up again, um, 
No, I can I can jump in and talk about Perfect. it otherwise. Okay, so one that's really popular and is currently open now is the Education Innovation and Research Grant. It used to be called the I-3 grant under the Obama administration and had lots of funds. Uh, now it's called Education Innovation and Research, and it is a very much um, evidence-based program. There are three different tiers um, to apply and often year after year there is a STEM priority which means applicants that address STEM in their programming will get additional points, so a leg up um, if you address STEM or computer science. Um, Congress um, in its appropriations actually set aside half of the funding and I think it's about uh, 185 million this in 2022 so half of the funding, like $90 million, will go to STEM projects, and another $90 million will go to um, um, social and emotional learning. Again, another sort of priority around, you know, how do we help kids and, and, and teachers through these um, trying times. So there's three levels of um, evidence that are required for the Education Innovation and Research Grant. One is called Early Phase. And this is where we see a lot of STEM and computer science proposals because, um, you know, the other stages require, you know, this um, sort of randomized um, controlled uh, research, randomized controlled trials. Yeah, um, not CRT, RCT. Um, and they, you know, are often housed and stored at the What Works Clearinghouse, the Institute of Educational Science, where um, Melissa resides. And so they, they're pretty strict and rigid. But the early phase allows for applicants that have sort of a theory of, of change or a logic model, or um, they have a nugget of evidence that you know, they know that this intervention is going to be helpful for students, for girls, for kids of color, for whatever your demographic is, to have some advance, whether it's in um, classroom achievement or, or in um, confidence, you know, in sort of their um, ability or thought or pursuit of a STEM career. So there's a lot of opportunity in that early phase for um, sort of new initiatives and programs that, you know, have been working well, they just haven't had sort of the larger scale um, investments that this grant can provide. So once they, you know, when, when and if, and if you don't succeed the first time, you know, try, try again. I was just talking with the program officer there, you know, they only have so much money and they're, they can fund the top, you know, whatever 10 or 20% of applicants. But the other, the next 20 could have been just as good. They just couldn't, you know, fund them all. So, you know, we always encourage people to reapply. Um, and the feedback from the peer reviewers is, you know, very helpful. Um, I've managed a few panels there and we try to be very constructive and, you know, uh, uh, encouraging grantees to reapply. And then oftentimes if you're successful with the early phase grant and then you apply for the mid phase grant, which allows you to grow the program into different communities and, and continue to do the research around efficacy, you know, they like the fact that you're kind of ratcheting up the ladder of evidence, you know, right? We don't wanna just invest one and done. We wanna grow something into really successful programs. So therefore there's different levels of application. So that's the in education, innovation and research early phase grants. Thanks Exan for, for pulling that up to, um, And then the other two that are really, I think important to the um, STEM teaching field are the two grants listed here. One is the Teacher Quality Partnership Program and the other is Supporting Effective Educator Development. One is really looking at prospective and new teachers, and the other is more about um, professional development for existing teachers. Um, TQP also looks at, you know, colleges of education, what are they doing right? What are they doing not so right? And how can we improve, you know, sort of the output of new, new instructors? Um, I don't, Melissa, is there anything else you want to add for TQP? I mean, those again are often go to institutes of higher ed, but they can partner with sort of content subject matter experts, which is where your membership could come in, right? Whether you have folks from industry or from, um, you know, other practitioners that can talk about STEM specific implementation, uh, it could be a boost in the 
um, partnership with the institutes of higher ed that often provide the professional development ultimately to the teachers. I guess the only two things I would add, Patty, before I think that talking about the evidence is really important because I think when people say evidence-based practice or evidence, like the, there's a very specific way that Ed talks about it. And so I'm, I'm glad Patty will walk us through that. But is thinking about, um, I think I do think that there are kind of two ways to think about discretionary grant opportunities like these, you can either be the lead applicant, in which case you're the person who's applying, or you can seek to partner on some of the, on some, with other people who are applying for the grant. So as Patty mentioned, if you know that an institution of higher ed in your ecosystem is planning to apply for a TQP grant or a seed grant or an EIR grant, you know, you could see if there are opportunities for you to join um, on that grant, or if you know that a program provider in your ecosystem is applying for an EIR grant, same thing. So I think there's multiple ways to think about it. And then I did see a question from Judd around EIR and emphasizing storytelling or communication component of the grant when applying. I, my best advice for federal grants is like read the notice and follow exactly what they want. So if they are not asking for um, a ton of communication or storytelling, I think most of the ed grants do ask for kind of a needs assessment. What, how, you know, why is your inter proposed intervention or proposed approach needed? Um, so certainly you could incorporate it there, but read the solicitation like many, many times and follow exactly what they're saying. Join the technical assistance webinars because they will walk or listen to the recordings of them. They will walk you through a lot of the sort of frequently asked questions. And then also read the proposals of the ones that were funded previously. Mm -hmm. um, you will get a lot of really good information about what people do fund and why um, if you read those previously funded grant applications. And from having served on panels, like just follow, yeah. Yeah, I follow mean, for the, for the reviewers, it's literally like a, a, ma a metrics checklist, right? So what, what's your, um, you know, your implementation plan and it's broken down into five point check chunks. So it's like check, check, check. You know, and obviously you can get zero to five points for every one of those. So you just want to make sure you address every question, even though it doesn't sound like a super high priority to have your theory of action. You know, yes, it is. And you want to tie your evaluation to that, right? So we just had a webinar or, you know, a, a staff meeting on or a series of staff meetings on evidence. And I'm going to share a little bit more about that in the next couple slides. So if we can advance to the next slide. Okay, thank you. So I was talking about this earlier about the three tiers for education, innovation and research grant. And I think so this has been like a really um, good example even within the department, like how to, and, and just to clarify, discretionary grants means that it's not, not everybody's entitled, right? So it's sort of up to the discretion of the department to decide who gets the funding, which means basically it's a competitive grant. You know, people can apply based on the eligibility definitions. And then there's this peer review process. So again, it's not like an internal decision. It's definitely uh, peer review, people in the field, um, you know, the staff may manage the panels, but we don't get involved in scoring. Um, you know, obviously when we get to the final, all the collect, all the scores, then there's a vetting of like how much, how many can we afford? And then we choose from that point on. But otherwise it's not like you can influence a staff person and get, you know, a win because we don't do the scoring. We only do the ranking. Um, so back to, um, the EIR, it, this is serving as like an example to other competitive grants in the department. It's not the darling necessarily, but it's a good model. And others are, you know, starting to incorporate some of these, um, these ideas. So as I mentioned, there's the early phase, the mid phase, and then the expansion grant, which um, quasi experimental, that was the phrase I was trying to come up with along with random control trials. Uh, <laughs> um, so, um, you know, take these to heart. There's lots of um, resources on the EIR webpage. Um, there, you know, all the technical webinars and explanations of these, of the application and the levels of evidence. Um, are there for your um, enjoyment. And then we'll go to the next slide. Um, and so here are some of the resources and where you can find this qualifying evidence that they're seeking. They want you to cite other projects like, you know, we know if you expose kids to so many hours per week, you know, in this topic, 
you, you can expect this kind of improvement. So, you know, they want to look at that, make sure that you're working with prior evidence and research. So these links will be in the slides that um, you'll have access to. So we can go to the next slide. Um, and then here's the um, sort of logic models. And these videos are um, developed by a contractor to help, again, grantees or applicants understand, you know, what does that logic model look like? How do you connect it with your evaluation? Um, and this will help you, I mean, this is like free consulting, you know, for anyone that's writing a grant. I mean, not whether, whether this goes to the Department of Ed or it goes to a nonprofit or some other, cor you know, corporate philanthropy, um, this is really good advice on grant writing. So please take advantage. And these videos are like seven or eight minutes each. So it, it's not like uh, too overwhelming, but it really gives you good food for thought in how to organize and sell your application. So we can go to the next slide. Um, some of the other resources, I mentioned the STEM newsletter. Um, I also host a series of STEM briefings, um, pseudo monthly, and those are also archived at the STEM website, uh, which is ed.gov slash STEM. Um, some other ones here are the Office of Educational Technology, and they are looking at you know, how to eliminate the digital divide. Um, there's going to be new money coming out of the uh, Infrastructure Act. Um, there's a sub act called the Digital Equity Act that's going to be administered by the National Telecommunications Industry, or um, not the Department of Ed necessarily. So, um, but those funds will be coming out to help with um, sort of connectivity. And the Office of Ed Technology creates a national plan each year to help states and districts, you know, decide how to manage that, that, that whole infrastructure around educational technology and digital access. And then um, the last two links are our um, annual, you know, constant uh, update of our funding forecast. It lists our open grants. Um, the department is organized around sort of these like five or six main offices. One is the program evaluation and policy development, um, the office of elementary and secondary education, the office of post-secondary education that um, manages, right, all of our um, university programs. Um, there's also the office of career, technical and adult education, which manages the CTE programs or Perkins five. Um, and then the Institute of Educational Sciences. There's also the Office of Special Education and Special Education Programs or Resor Rehab Services. Um, so lots of, um, and these are all noted on the STEM webpage because again, just because the grant doesn't say this is a STEM program, doesn't mean you can't go in and say, we wanna do STEM and work with kids with disabilities. You know, or we want to do STEM and work with English language learners. So, you know, there's lots of opportunities to embed STEM in um, these federal funded programs. And I think that's the last, no, is that the last slide for me? I had for you, yep. Yeah, and uh, and I wanted to just circle back to the evidence piece that we were talking a little bit about, because one of the things when you're talking to your state education agencies or your local education agencies, they all are thinking about evidence-based practice as well. Um, and they are talking about it in a very particular way, which is the same way that we at the department are talk about evidence. Um, so as defined in the Every Student Succeeds Act, as Patty mentioned, there are different levels of evidence, sort of tiers one through four, um, with four being the strongest level, or sorry, four being uh, demonstrates a rationale all the way up to one, which is the strongest level of evidence. I think we um, need to go back one more slide. That I think oh, you're speaking to that right there. We actually, go. it's to the, yeah, this is, no. I, I would go to the practice guides, which is the very last slide. Oh, okay. Um, and I'm going to pop in. Um, so one thing as you are sort of demonstrating, or if you're thinking about your work and you are wanting to go and say, hey, you know, we have all these American Rescue Plan funds that are available. Um, we're here to help, we're here to support. And talking about your work, when you are talking about the evidence that you have, 
aligning it to the ed tiers is very, very helpful so that you can make your district and state's lives a little easier by saying, you know, we have these kinds of studies, we have this kind of logic model, we're basing our work off of X, Y, or Z research that has been done. And when you're doing that, um, one of the, um, actually even better, Joseph, great question. I'll, I'll come right back to that. One of the tools that you can use to know what kinds of levels of evidence there are, are these practice guides. So I put on the slide a list of the practice guides that focus on uh, you know, science, technology, engineering, or math. Um, or some of some combination of both. And you can then actually say like my, my program or my product is actually a, you know, we do the same thing, um, you know, as, a, as aligned to the what IES, What Works Clearinghouse Practice Guide X, we do X, Y, or Z to support science instruction, or we do X, Y, or Z to support math instruction, or we do X, Y, or Z to um, encourage girls in math and science. So these are tools that help to kind of make the evidence work a little bit more user friendly. These are some of my favorite tools that IES has that are related to instructional practice. And so hopefully you and the educators that you work with and the programs that you work with um, and run or lead will find these to be helpful as well to make sure that you're doing the best of what we know in terms of what works for students um, right now in terms of STEM in terms of STEM. And Joseph, to your question, Yes, we will definitely send the links and the PowerPoints um, and we'll make sure everyone has them. Joseph, to your question, if you wanna support science rather than STEM, we've been using STEM as an acronym, but there are many places where you could be applying to support science or, um, you know, so you don't necessarily have to address all letters of STEM when we're talking about them. If you wanted to have an education, innovation and research early phase grant proposal that was focused solely on science, that would certainly be, you know, relevant. Um, as well. And same thing for some of the other grant um, applications too. Um, I will pop, yes, I heard a question. I think it's time for questions. Yeah. I was actually just putting in the chat, we only have about five more minutes until we close. So if you have any questions about implementation, either hit that reactions button and that raise hand button or go ahead and put them um, in, in the chat. Um, while we're waiting for those to come in, uh, Patty, Melissa, I, I wonder if there are things, so I, I'm thinking, you know, again, about, about NeoSTEM, even before we look at the different opportunities that are available, are there things that we should be thinking about in our ecosystem that make us ready and more likely to be recipients and partners on this funding in, in your experience? What, what are the kind of pre-steps that everybody should be taking and thinking about now to make sure that, that they're a good candidate for, for some of these opportunities? Relationships and evidence, those are my two. You build the relationships with all of the key stakeholders, make sure that they see you as a true partner. So not someone who's always lobbying them or asking them for something, but a true partner who's out there doing the work, et cetera. I would definitely, so build those relationships um, and have evidence for your work. Um, and that a lot of times districts and states um, evidence is a very helpful currency because they are having to tell us at the federal level how they are utilizing evidence-based practice to advance student outcomes um, in a variety of different ways. So um, if you, I popped the evidence-based guidance documents, how to use evidence uh, to inform education inv investments, that can give, a, that gives a very helpful primer about how we define evidence, what that means, and how you can think about building and using evidence in your work. Um, so definitely encourage you to build relationships and build evidence and use evidence. And, and that primer, which, which I haven't seen before, so I, I just scanned it, but I'm, I'm excited to dig into it. I think it's so critical. If you, if you um, even if you're not sure what you're going to do, man, open up that link and save that because I know a conversation that happens at every single ecosystem's convening is, I know we need evidence. I know that we're doing good things, but I don't really know how to show it. Um, and it seems, and, and Melissa, correct me if I'm wrong, in my quick scan, it seems like that document's gonna answer some of those questions and help shape, can help shape internal policy to make sure that, that we're collecting the, the right types of things. You know, and the thing is, too, it's not all about creating new evidence. I mean, it's about demonstrating that there is existing evidence that what you're doing works, right? It, it, there's plenty of evidence that talks about informal science exposures and learning. There's plenty of evidence about, you know, um, 
hands-on experiential learning, work-based learning. So, you know, you just have to connect your work with existing evidence. Uh, it's nice if you're able to collect data and do a longitudinal study that costs money. I mean, that's why you're typically looking for a grant is to is to build that research and evidence base. But there, you know, if you look at any of the grants and you can see many of the applications um, online for a lot of these programs on our website and you read them, they will create citations, you know, that you can use as well. And some of them are, you know, 20 years old, you know, whether it's Piaget or, you know, other factors that we know, you know, what methods of teaching and learning, um, you know, whether it's National Academies of Engineering and Science and Science Engineering and Math. I mean, there are resources out there to build your case. It doesn't necessarily have to be unique data and evidence, but you want to make sure that, you know, you're, you're including those types of citations and it's not just willy nilly, you know, feel good statements. But yes, relationships are important. Um, a call earlier, I was on with the deputy governor of Illinois and I said, you know, are you working with the ecosystems? There's three ecosystems in Illinois. And he's like, we have a P20 council, you know, so make sure that, you know, from the top down, you are known as a resource, right? As Melissa said, don't go always go in with your hand out, go in with, you know, biscuits and coffee, right? Like this is what we're doing. We just want you to know. And as Melissa also said, come check us out. You know, this is, um, you know, what we're doing in your community. We think you, you know, whether it's like a culminating event so that they can get like a photo op or, you know, it's an opportunity to engage with the students. Um, you know, politicians need to be out in the uh, in the in the arena, right? And and so you know, having them come to an event is important, and then you know that will stick in their head and and remember it next time that they're looking, you know, for examples to to defend a program or policy. Well, thank you, Patty and Melissa, um, Xan. Well, everybody, but in particular, Xan, I want to point out Judd's question in the chat that we absolutely can't answer in the forty-five seconds we have left, uh, but that probably, frankly, deserves a whole session. Uh, Judd's question is: Old evidence is often rooted. I, I'm sure a lot of the time um, on purpose, and a lot of the time not on purpose, in racist and inequitable practices. What's your recommendation for getting supports for the next practice? I think this is a, a really critical conversation that we should be looking at holding for everyone's notes. Uh, so, Melissa, uh, Patty, you thank a, you so much. Yep. I was going to say a, a very quick take on that, Judd. The research education laboratories are boots on the ground for IES that are working currently with departments of ed and working, um, con, you know, on community challenges. And so a lot of the tools coming out of the research education laboratories are newer, faster, and, and I mean, and faster, it's like one year turnaround instead of a five year turnaround for a paper, that kind of stuff. But I highly recommend getting on the listserv for the research education laboratories webinars and their events and their outputs. Like they just came out, one of them just came out with a practice guide around um, family math nights. So there's like more, there's more and newer. Um, so yes, Judd, you, you found it and you popped the link in there. That would be one way. And then as Jeremy said, we could probably spend another hour on that, but I didn't want to, I wanted to make sure to mention the RELs on that too topic. Thank you so much, Melissa, for, for closing us out with that. You know, what a privilege it's been to sit together as colleagues in this work these last three sessions. I really love learning from the STEM Next fellows, and I hope that this conversation really continues. Uh, we do have a golden opportunity coming up to meet and share resources just like these and to have deeper conversations. Um, you know, we all know that, that a lot of great conversations happen in webinars and in sessions, and a lot of great conversations happen over dinner and at coffee, and we finally have the opportunity to have those types of interactions again. Uh, the SLE COP Bay City convening coming up June 20th to the 22nd. There will be field trips, adult recess, and I have it on good authority that there will be lots and lots of lunch and food. So all my favorite school subjects when I was a kid are covered. The Bay City team is working closely with ties and local officials to put a high level of safety protocols in place for our participation. If you'd like to be part of the Bay City CLE, SLE COP convening in June, please go ahead and register. There's a link going in the chat, but you can also find it at stemecosystems.org. Um, we're very excited to hopefully see all of you there. And those of you who aren't there, we will see you the next time we're all together here virtually. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.